Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as I said before, we just need to remind you to turn off your phones. There's no photos and no filming during the duration of this talk. Um, but thank you again for coming. Of course, this is the first of four Red Bull Music Academy lectures that are happening as part of CTM Festival 2018. Um, and here we have our first special guest on the couch, self-described forward-thinking Jamaican collective Equinox from Kingston, Jamaica. Please help me to welcome you. Um, I think one of the reasons why Equinox are here and um, have the profile that they have now is that you find yourselves in a pretty unique place. Um, you're this collective that's a record label and production house that it's at the centre of this hugely popular and influential dancehall sound from Jamaica. Um, and you're working with superstar acts like Capleton and Beanie Man and Elephant Man, etc. Um, but at the same time, you've cultivated this really quite avant-garde or experimental approach, um, particularly in the creation of rhythms, um, and that's earned you comparisons to the likes of Lee Scratch Perry and King Tubby. Um, so hopefully throughout the course of this conversation, we'll have a little bit of insight into how these two sides of the Equinox universe come together. Um, and yeah, so first of all, from the left, uh, we've got Jordan Chung here, AKA Time Cow. In the middle, we've got Shanique Marie and Gavin Blair, AKA Gavsborg. Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to jumping into this chat with you. Um, the first question I wanted to ask actually was in preparation for this, reading particularly about the last few years of releases and a lot of the music that has um, kind of brought you to a bigger audience. This idea of um, Equinox making dance hall weird again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's this phrase that I keep hearing repeated over and over. And my question to you, to you is actually, um, did dance hall ever actually stop being weird? Or is this, is this a view that's kind of coming from outside of Jamaica or outside of the scene? Uh, I think on the, on the popular front of it, it had stopped being weird. It started to get like very, very um, very what 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 people consider how popular music sounds in this day and age. That's that's so that's so that's the, the type of direction that it started to take. Like in the nineties, <laughs> the eighties, and so on. It was it was weird and it was popular. You understand, but. But no, it's 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 just popular, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that kind of popular chart-topping sound, um, you also have crossed paths with some of these artists who have become huge superstars within Jamaica and outside of it. Um, in terms of like the entire breadth of the music that you've created, like in amongst your collective and also working with other people, I mean, how how much of that is apparent or kind of present for you when you're making music is there a sense of um we kind of need something that's going to be a coconut jelly man that's going to kind of be able to reach out to a number of different people how do you strike that balance between things that are a little bit more experimental and things that um have you know so-called crossover appeal mm. <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> yes that's why you enjoyed it um i, d I don't think we really think about it that much. It's not. It's not that intentional. Um, when it gets intentional, is when we're doing like more writing, and we just really have to correct here and there. Like yesterday, we were walking in Paris, and um, Gavin was ahead of us. I mean, Shanique were walking, and you know, Shanique was saying, "Wow, my hair is getting curly again." <laughs> so. Um, Actually, because uh, we, we I find that we tend to do this. Uh, we did it in Mexico the other day as well. We, we made a song about you know having curly hair, so it was like what? Um, girls, girls, girls with curls and swords and things. Yeah. So what what we would do now in the after process is then to like maybe just correct some lyrics or do something like that. But it's really. Um, about like what we see and just like an everyday thing it's not it's not really okay all right we need to sing a song about the coconut jelly man because they're really uh, underrepresented in jamaica yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i think just to jump in i use this word every time 
we have an interview and i think that's because it's the realest word to is to describe um what we create everything that we do is is very organic um and as jordan said we're we're not going into the studio like hmm this is what's hot let's create something or hmm we want to be weird let's think what what could be weird it's it's the energy and the vibe um that exists in the moment and we are a group that creates things based on passion and just emotion and how we feel uh so like i might go into the studio and i might be joking around and i might just do a story like ah gavin is recording it <laughs> jordan is recording it then there is a rhythm they build and it sounds like a door in it you know that's really <laughs> that's really how that's really how everything comes together for us and i think i think that is what makes our music so appealing because it's it's us and it's real and it's 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 what we are it's not something that has been created in a lab it's natural and i think once we don't try too hard to to say we're going to do this because that's what needs to be done i think that's when the universe says oh i like this let's push it out there and the waves go out and ne the next thing we know we have a coconut jelly man <laughs> I mean, you just mentioned being in paris yesterday and um kind of riffing on something is this process of making music for you, I'm curious to know, how does it actually work? Do you have a central studio in Kingston where you can all get together and it's like a lab, you're kind of bouncing off each other? Um, that I can see heads nodding. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, we, we, all, have, we all have a central, a central base in <laughs> Kingston. It's in, it's in Vineyard Town, it's in <coughs> East Kingston, where one of, my, one of my legends is from, which is Dave Kelly. Um, so it's a very special place to us um, and we all, congregate there on a daily basis and and do what we do you know <laughs> is that becoming more difficult now that you're on the road more that you're traveling more um, um to be able to find that time to get together well we're together on the road we're together so. <laughs> on the road so it works so out it, it, it's still it's still good you know yeah, yeah, yeah. right um, oh and i was just gonna say for example yesterday in paris like <laughs> i think I think even more so now that we're on the road um, and we're traveling and we're meeting people and seeing things and experiencing things, um, we're right there with each other. So we're like bouncing things off each other right as it happens. So I think we're even more so having things happen in real time. So I think it, it works out even better now that we're on the road. Right, and I'm, I'm assuming that this kind of dynamic between you is something that's developed because you've known each other um, for quite some time. Um, can you let us know a little bit about how it all came together? I know that, that Gavin um, is kind of a universe that you've, that's revolving around you. Uh, it would be great to hear a little bit about how that came together um, with the core members of Equinox. Um, well, it started a very long time ago. Um, M many many moons ago. <laughs> not that long. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it started originally as a as a rap group in high school. Yes, I had aspirations of being a rapper. Um, I was like into a lot of hoot and clan and that sort of stuff, and that was where my my core um, foreign inspiration was from. Um, so we all wanted to be rappers. Um, and this was about in fifth form. I don't know how you call it here. Fifth, eleventh grade. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then high school pretty much ended, and then some of the members moved on, you know, to real lives. <laughs> 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 you know, um, working in corporate Jamaica, going to university. I didn't do any of that at the time. I was just about the music. Um, so ov over the course of over the course of at, at, at that time, um, there was there was one member called Jimmy the Toucan and he migrated to Canada and wasn't able to be active in the group as, as much as he used to and then funny thing is that 
a, good, a very good friend of his that we all went to school together. It was Woolmer's Boys School, actually, in Kingston. He returned to Jamaica from studying in Canada, so they kind of traded places. So this person is called Bobby the Blackbird, which is still a member, but not, not on the road with us at the moment. Um, and then Bobby Blackbird and I had, you know, similar interests, you know, we, 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 we saw things similarly. Um, so we, 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 we continued with Equinox. Um, over the next couple of years, and we, we actually at 2005 now, right? Over the next couple of years, other people came on who shared interests, and they left as well. Um, so we we all the way to 2009 now, and it's so. Shanique. Um, 2005. Well, I first met Shanique in 2005 on MSN Messenger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> should, <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> she was still, she was still, she was still, she was still, uh, she was not of age yet to be, to be, to be doing anything really. Um, but we, we, we spotted some, some talent, you know, through, through a friend of, of hers who was kind of like playing like a, a big sister, half manager type of thing. Um, so she introduced Shanique to us and Shanique was to come to the studio one night and she came without Shanique, so I'm like, where's, where's this girl that you've been telling me about? Um, and she's like, uh, this might be embarrassing. She's like, her, her mom says that she can't come out because she's too young. Um, so the, 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 the link kind of died. Um, and then a couple of years after, in 2009, we were reintroduced um, by, by me doing a favor for a friend who was doing a commercial and he was like, can you record a vocal for me? I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so it turned out that the person was Shanique, right? And now she was of age to, <laughs> to um, operate. I drove <laughs> to <laughs> she, the studio. She, she had a driver's license. She drove <laughs> to the studio. Um, and then we just struck gold there, you know? Um, and then a few, a few years after that, no, there was this, there was this mystical, <laughs> A mystical character stalking me and and um on MSN Messenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and it turned out to be to be Jordan. You know, he was he was sending me some tracks and I was like, What are these tracks? <laughs> they, <laughs> they were both they were both I was both repulsed by them, I was I was inspired. it was it was everything. <laughs> Um, everything good, everything bad. Um, I was telling him to change them. I was telling him not to change them. Um, but what, what I spotted deep down was a very special thing in the tracks. Um, and the passion. And the passion, you know. Um, and then b by then I had already decided that I was going to make my mom happy and go to university. <laughs> um, so I'm a little older than, than he is. Um, and Shadik as well. <laughs> um, so we actually met up in, in, in university, the University of Technology in Kingston. Um, right, so we, we, we met there in person. I, was, I think I was walking along the, the, the hallways one day and I got a text saying, like, I see you. Or <laughs> 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 see um, you. <laughs> right, so we, we, we met up there and I was like, it's a, it's a cool kid, you know. Um, and then we, we, we all just started making music together. And, and then by then we had, we had a, a MC who was more or less a staple because we work with a lot of MCs, but there, there are a few who have a, a very special place. Shanique is one. Um, and then another one is Chemical. And over the next couple of years, that it, it just kind of um, molded itself together as, hey, you know, this is the team. So it's, it's, it's Shanique, Timeco, mm -hmm. Chemical, Blackbird. And myself. The Fantastic Five. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awesome. Um, I also wanted to ask a little bit about how reflective Equinox is um, with regards to uh, like perhaps sound system culture or production culture in Jamaica, which of course has um, laid the groundwork in terms of all of these incredible um, like petri dishes of experimentation going on. Is this something that you see as a spirit that you're carrying on in what you're doing or you are kind of forging your own path in this way? Definitely, we, we, um, it's in the spirit. It, I mean, you, have, you literally have no choice. Um, the, 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 
the sound systems are are in the streets you know so once you're in the streets you're gonna be influenced by the sound system whether directly or indirectly you know it's either gonna disturb the life out of you or you, you, you're gonna enjoy you know um and we more or less enjoy you know it's kind of just always there it's it, it's a part of the jamaican just it's it's a constant background sound the sound system you hear it you know when you're in your house you hear it when you're going to school um when i used to go to a a, a religious um place i used to hear it while i'm in there um so it, it's everywhere you know mm -hmm. um yeah and i'm also curious to know is there um a sense of kind of purism in terms of how that plays out musically if it's if it's such a present part of everyday life is there a sense that it should be related to like kind of more of a roots reggae sound or like kind of early 60s or 70s traditional dance hall or do you think that an embracing of forward-thinking production and embracing other styles of music is also part of the Jamaican sound at the moment? Yeah, it's it's always been a part of it. They've, they've always embraced it. But the thing is that, um, like Jamaica has created a, 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 a number of genres of have, have, has come out of Jamaica over the years. But they've come out with such speed and <laughs> multitude that it's like Jamaica has, has grown used to, you know, just getting it and moving on to the next thing, moving on to the next thing. But it's not that they're not great in any sense, but you know, we just have a lot inside of us because of that same culture of just the sound system and everything. But it's that, meanwhile, it, it may take longer or last longer in other places. It, it just doesn't last that much in Jamaica, but, you know, we try we try to, to always keep on doing it. I mean, somebody has to do it. And people are actually there doing it. It's just that, you know, maybe on the level that they're at, it, it, it's not... Um, I don't think the light has been shining upon it as yet, you know. I think also um, to add to that is uh, Jamaican culture generally is like that. Um, we are we are a fast-paced set of people, and so we're always rediscovering and moving. And so, as Jordan said, you know, things there is a there is a quick digestive period, and then. It's rediscovery, or it's or or more creation. So I think a lot of that also has to do with how Jamaican people are as a as a people. Uh, as I said, we are quicksilver people. So <laughs> I think that has a lot to do with um, with why things aren't necessarily marinated. And then yeah, I mean I I've always had this this sense of enjoying sound system culture and what it represents because I, I love this idea of these kind of family type configurations but <clears throat> within that there's this kind of like friendly rivalry as well you're only as good as your last rhyme or your mm -hmm. last rhythm mm -hmm. so is that something that also exists between you guys as well you're kind of one up one upping each other and egging each other on to some degree uh definitely yes <laughs> definitely yes i i would have to say that um we're all very critical of each other and we know that that is important because um, we are one in three and three in one or five in one rather and one in five um, so we always have to push each other and you know you know and analyze what we've done or analyze our last performance our last production and reflect on it um, because we know that um, when we push each other we're pushing the group um, you are only as strong as your weakest link and it's important for all our links to be as strong as possible so yeah I do think that we were always you know like for example I performed last night um, we performed last night and when I was singing um, I made a little glitch with one of the lyrics I was hoping that these two didn't hear <laughs> but they did and after the performance they're like look how you said the wrong thing on the stage <laughs> now of course the audience didn't realize of course because I was smooth <laughs> but um, I the whole time after I was like Lux they're gonna call me out on it, man. 
and they did and it's important you know if if you're in a group and your group members aren't trying to bring out the best in you then that's not a group and as a matter of fact we're not even a group we're a family and family means no one gets left behind so <laughs> i know you guys watched that movie did you yeah i see you <laughs> yeah so um yeah we definitely make sure that we're all we're like the geese i don't know if you know the story of the geese um when they're moving or when they're migrating in the in the winter time there is oftentimes um one of the geese is at the at the front and they this is <laughs> Please, he did not excel in English, um, but they carry each other, and um, the geese at the back, they constantly honk to, to, to make sure that they, the one at the front stays strong, and then they, they switch places, and they're very, very unified, and that's how they all make it together, and so I, I use that analogy just to say that that's how we all make it together and i think that's how our productions and our performances come out strong and on top that's a nice segue into one of my other questions uh about birds and bird sounds and which has become something of a production signature um for you where did this originate from well um it started really um in the beginning from from just sampling just, just whatever I would leave a recorder running on that pipe, you know, whatever it is, you know. We just didn't want to use something that said um, Timberland sample pack or <laughs> or Neptune sample pack. Um, and even if we did, which we, which we, you know, it all comes on experimentation. We we, we try to we try to um, make it. Um, into our into our own, you know, it it, 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 it turns into something else. Um, so naturally, we came across you know animals and and birds just just turned out to be the the, the, the favorite one to sample. Um, and then one day one day my mom was was entertaining a friend in the in the in the um in the dining room and the friend was like, what's that what's that What's that bird um, sound that, that 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 keeps coming from out the the, the, um, the room where your son is, and and she was like, oh well, his name is Gavin, and it's a uh, got the name from Scotland, and and it means it means hawk um, or little hawk man, and 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 it turns out that the the um the the, the sample that I was using at the time was a hawk. Um, so then it became some kind of special, some kind of special <laughs> thing. So that was like the, organic. That was like the stamp for, for for me to just push on with that, you know. And then I, I, when I met Nick, who is Blackbird, he was already Blackbird, and I was like, <laughs> "All right, cool, <laughs> it's a bird thing." That <laughs> it's a theme you can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's about time to um, listen to another track. Um, I think I'm going to select something. Kind of from your, your back catalogue, one of your um, most popular rhythms, I believe, in uh, Jamaica, which was 100 Stab by Aedon Aedonia. 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 All right, let's have a listen to that and then uh, we'll continue the chat after that. That was Flying Dagger, aka 100 Stab by Aedonia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that track is perhaps like 10 years old is that is that correct yeah almost, almost 10 almost 10 quite a controversial tune as well <laughs> yeah yeah and it's funny though like when you look up that track in particular on youtube like there's quite a few versions of it but all of them have people from like it's 2016 this track's still fucking me up like yeah, yeah, people yeah. are crazy for it um and i picked that particular track because i think it was a good indication of what i have what i feel is a pretty big signature of the Equinox production sound of taking one like quite prominent element and like looping it and stretching it yeah, and really yeah. making that a, a central part of the track. So before we get onto the controversy, um, I'd love to know, how did you come around to that type of 
signature, I suppose? Oh, I really don't know how to <laughs> answer that. <laughs> <laughs> or is that something that you, you recognize as a recurring? Yeah, it, 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 really, just, it really just comes. Um, and, and it's a part of dance hall to, to, have, to have something that is, is, is repetitive, but it, it doesn't bore you to the, you know, it, y you can listen to it for, for, for 15 minutes, really, because that's how long you'll end up listening to it, because it's, it's, it's one rhythm, and then it has, like, sometimes up to 60 vocal tracks on it. Right. You know, so y you could be playing one rhythm for two hours if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, so it's important that, that, that it's something that is, is, is repetitive, but, but still fluid, where... 60 different artists can come and hear 60 different things from it, you know, engaging it in different ways without it being annoying, really. Um, so that's, that's pretty much a culture that raised us. And um, you mentioned the, the controversy, and the track is, is, well, the first version of the track is called Flying Dagger, um, which, of course, relates to uh, daggering, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a very controversial... Um, right. <laughs> Oh, it's been banned? Yeah, it was banned. It was, it was banned, banned, actually. Okay. Oh, well, for the benefit of people here who might not know what daggering is, yeah. it's um, a very aggressive or a very vigorous form of sexual. dance yeah. Yeah. that's very <laughs> sexual, and it, but it's almost acrobatic. Um, <laughs> so w what was the basis of it being banned? Was it like health and safety or is it like a moral, <laughs> moral yeah, outrage? It was, it, it was more health and safety that day. Um, <laughs> that the, the, the broadcasting corporation um, used as, as the measure for it to be banned because it was, it was getting a bit crazy still, you know, people, <laughs> were, people were jumping off jumping buildings. Jumping off buildings <laughs> to, you know. it, uh, um, uh, homework for you guys. <laughs> Go home or while you're sitting on the train, not while you're riding your bicycles or anything like that. Go on YouTube and look up, um, dance videos or um, street dance daggering. daggering videos so you can have an idea of what this daggering is so so daggering the dance is um sorry the dance is like a it's like symbolic of the sexual activity that um that some Males and females in Jamaica engaging, and um, it's not your intimate, passionate, slow. I like long walks on the beach, um, vigorous <laughs> wine, and um, Netflix and chill kind of thing. It's more like let's get down to business kind of thing. Um, but then there is the meaning of dagger as well, um, and so it it was kind of. I think the broadcasting commission felt as well because if you if you as you listen to that song just now not knowing that daggering is related to a dance you would hear hundred stab thousand juke you guys don't know what juke is i can tell you it if i juke jordan with it's some okay <laughs> if i had something in my hand that was sharp and i went like that to jordan that's a juke which is basically the same as like a stab so you could see why um, that would not necessarily be the best thing to be. Yeah. So I think that's why the Broadcasting Commission felt like that was a bit harsh. And so they just banned daggering altogether. Yeah, but mean, that song still... It had, it, it's the still... Daggering had become a genre of its own. Yes. So, I mean, they couldn't really stop it by any other measure other than to just ban it, ban it all really together. Completely. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the so word itself was banned. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. like from television, right? And yeah. Right. And radio a, and a funny like. story is that the, that that song was was in the was in the local top ten charts, and so you'd be watching the charts, and then you would see the other songs coming. And then, and you'd hear the songs. You would see the whatever visual they had attached, and then that would that one would come on, and then you just see a blank screen, and then it was put <laughs> put the name, and then edit dagger in. Yeah. You know, it was like okay, well, uh, Mama have a song in the top ten charts, but you can't really hear it. You know. <laughs> yeah. And and what about the performance of the dance as well? Is that also regulated? Does it have to happen like in underground parties? It still happens in the underground. Not a, not as much. Not as much, you know. But I mean, people are getting hurt. 
<laughs> trying to do these things. I mean, we literally, like, people were um, jumping from the roof um, at a street dance. The, the, the girl would lie flat on the ground, and the guy would jump from the roof and jump on her. And vice versa. And well. vice versa. <laughs> and there were, unfortunately, some incidences where people got hurt. Um, right. I mean, why would... Well, let's not get into why. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things have happened. So um, that had a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah. And that kind of particular rhythm of that track, because it's so... Um, it's almost like a polka or something. It's got such an unusual rhythm to it. Is that informed by the dance or the dance informs that or it just kind of came together as, as it was? You, you know what, the, what, 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 the, what Dagarin was actually doing, it was, it was taken from, from very old Jamaican traditions, from Kumina, from Brookings. Dinky Mini. Um, Dinky Mini. <laughs> so the, 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 the dance initially from where it's coming from, it's really supposed to be something sacred, right? But because it's 2009, 2010, and not so sacred words have been put to it, it, it changes so, you know, it was, it was viewed. Um, it's tearing apart at the moral <laughs> fabric <laughs> of the society. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's really something that's, that's 300, 400 years old, and, and that's, that's how far I can trace it back to. I'm, I'm Not the jumping off the roof part. <laughs> <laughs> that's new. <laughs> that's new. Right, but, but the, actual, the actual movements, it, it's, it's very old movements, you know, so but I would say it, it kind of informed the, the, the um, whatever was happening in 2009, it was something, you know, centuries ago that was informing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of fast forwarding a few years from there, um, and perhaps even before that period when dance hall kind of crossed over into main street pop music um, with artists like Sean Paul, etc. Um, and then another wave with artists like Drake and, and Rihanna and even Ed Sheeran. Um, but I remember reading uh, sometime in the last couple of years that a particular club in London um, was told by the police that they weren't able to play dance hall because it... it, it because their reasoning was that um, having dance hall music meant that there would be a spike in aggressive behaviour and violence and whatnot. I mean, what's what's your kind of take on that? Um, I I just feel like there's this idea that dance hall is it's seen to be such a threat to the moral fibre that even kind of outside of Jamaica, like part of the Jamaican diaspora, is still going to be affected by these negative connotations around dance hall. Were you aware of it first of all? And yeah. yeah. Well, um, dance uh, as an art form is is an art form that reflects what's actually happening in Jamaica, and it's it's never been tried to be curved by any other artists, any other producers. It's really just raw, and you get that rawness when you come to Jamaica, and it's exported just the same, you know. But it's not like the the this this thing that they're saying like um. The lyrics, the violent lyrics, saying, "All right, you know, go kill this guy, this and that, that, that." It's all very contextual, you know. So a lot of the things that they say, like I don't know, I don't know, as a very uh, song that I like now called "Hot Tool." So out of the context of Jamaica, if if someone comes to you and say, "Yo, you know, somebody just may have the hot tool," <laughs> you know, you you probably really wouldn't understand what he's trying to say. So it's really within the diaspora that something like that happens. I mean. In London, you have people saying like showerman and things like that. Where <laughs> in Jamaica, you know, if some set of people from a particular political um, view said they were a showerman, it, it wouldn't really end well, you know. Right. So it's very contextual, and people have to realize that. So you can't just put like a broad thing on it and say, well, Jamaican music is very violent and so and so because a lot of music draws from the violin i mean hip-hop draws from like actual things that are there dancers draw from actual things but whereas i mean more the world can identify with maybe hip-hop because of the terms they use <laughs> uh, jamaica is very is very intense and as we say it, it, things move fast there so the words change the terms change all of that so it's kind of hard to keep up but uh, what you get is the rawness <laughs> and you know i guess that kind of brings 
and it brings a uh, 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 in the people as well. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not that we're going out and saying, "Oh, yo, it's bad, it's bad." You just wanted to do it back to me. It's not. It's not that kind of thing. I think that um, we know that music is a a manifestation of of people. Music is created by people, and there is always the binary opposites. There's always good. There's always bad. I think. Um, I think that. You know, with with persons saying that dance hall incites you know violence in in particularly in the youth, uh, it's it's all across the board. Every genre has you know speaks to the 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 good things and the bad things, the positives and the negatives. And music is very influential. I I we have no statistics to show that dance hall has influenced young people in a way that that drives them to a point where they would act in a negative way but i mean it's it's very possible that sitting down listening to some dance hall lyrics that says yo kill them all and done might might you know might build fire in a young person um that of course has to do with a lot of other things it it would be issues that they would be you know you know going through on their own accord or whatever but it's it's with everything it's with hip hop it's with rock it's it's in it's in all the different genres there is there will always be someone who is negatively charged by the music i think it's unfair to you know, to limit one genre to say this is it. Dance hall is what is causing persons to behave erratically. Um, but I, we, we knew of it. Um, it's something that we've heard over time. Um, but yet, we must highlight and um, and um, emphasize on the positives. Uh, that come from dance hall. A lot of dance hall music provides a feeling of belonging and empowerment for the youth in Jamaica and within the diaspora. Um, there's a lot of uh, dance hall artists who are putting out music that is talking about um, ghetto youths must rise and, you know, um, just hold the faith and be strong and and there's a lot of young people I know that listen to dance hall music and it drives them to do their schoolwork or it it drives them to go out there and get a job or or it it empowers them the musically creative ones to say you know what I can be like like Equinox who is out there you know seeing the world and and impacting persons with their you know with their music so. I mean, there is there is the bad mm-hmm. to dance hall as as with any genre, and there is the positive as well. Mm-hmm. I guess on the flip side of that, there's also um, a huge community of dance hall appreciators and dance hall creators who aren't in Jamaica as well. Like I know that there was a particular connection with a crew in Poland who were pretty instrumental in kind of. Um, I suppose, introducing you to a new audience in Europe. So what, what have some of those experiences been like, kind of travelling to different parts of the world and discovering these people who are like die-hard uh, dance hall lovers and supporters? Yeah, I mean, P- Poland, Poland was, with, when, with an emphasis on Warsaw, was actually the first place that, 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 um, that we knew existed, really, outside of Jamaica in a in a musical sense directly to us. There was a guy that came to our studio called 27 Pablo and he was like, listen, you, we, we, we have your song as the number one song. Um, it was RDX, a song called Movements. It was 2010, yeah. Um, I was like, what? <laughs> what do what, what you mean by that? Um, anyway, um, we started communicating more and more, and he kept on saying, you know, hey, come to Poland. I was like, yeah, but to do what, though? Like, I was, I was looking at the, the, the plane tickets, and I was like, do I really need to come to Poland? <laughs> um, 
And he was like, listen, you better come because we've just opened a lounge and we've called it Equinox. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, show me. <laughs> so he sends a YouTube video with like a tour of the place and I was like completely blown away. And then immediately after that, one of the members of that crew got a tattoo like across her fingers that said Equinox. And I was like, all right, what's, what, what's, what's happening here? <laughs> What's happening here, you know? Um, so we just released a, a, a mixtape at the time. Um, it was with a vocalist called Massacre, called Equinox Introduces Massacre <laughs> to King Toby. And it really struck, it really struck a nerve with, 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 with peeps in Poland. And the, the same friend, 27 Pablo, was like, listen, you need to come and perform that mixtape. I was like, but like, what do you mean by perform it? Like, I'm not a performer, I'm a producer. <laughs> like, stop that. <laughs> um, and he's like, but yeah, you can DJ. I'm like, but I can't. <laughs> um, and, and what really happened was that um, it was 2013, and, and that the performance was, uh, I think, on Friday. And on Thursday, I was in Warsaw learning how to DJ. Um, it, it didn't go as well as I wanted it to go. The, the first event didn't go as well as I wanted it to go, but um, it still went very good. Um, and then I, I think by the second event, we're like already pros at it. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, DJing was something that we always wanted to do, but we, we, didn't, we didn't really get a chance to explore it. We, did, we, we just didn't see the function of it. There's no like... There's no like known duality in Jamaica, like the, 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 the producer who DJs or the DJ who produces. Um, you're either one or the other, basically. And it's more seen as like a progression, like maybe you started out as a DJ, then you progress to a producer, and then you, your DJ life is another life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like you reincarnated to be a producer or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, right, so 27 Pablo was the, was, the, was the first person who like pointed out to us that like yo, you can you can kind of do both, you know. Um, it it can actually work, and we did it, and it worked, and then um, we just kept on doing it, really. Um, and 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 Poland supported, um, and then we we started seeing a lot of support from a lot of other places. I, I guess a lot of places were were supporting, but then we we couldn't really pick it up because you know um, it's not it's not the time of Instagram yet or you know, um so you're lucky if you see a tweet from someone or excuse me. Um right, so that's how it really started and then it just kinda spiraled into us learning about a lot of places. Um another core place turned out to be Manchester in the UK. Um where there is a man speaking to me on SoundCloud kinda anonymously. And I, I just kind of knew that he was onto something special. All um, the good people come into his life. <laughs> 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 the, the name of that person was John K. Um, he didn't really identify himself as such. I think he just said his name was John. I was like, John, okay. Um, You're very welcoming of pe anonymous people who reach out to you. On he the likes night. the, the There's creepy a thing, thing with the words, you know, you can kind of tell by, by, you can kind of tell a bit of the intent with, with, with the words, you know, if, hey, is this person going to waste your time? Or There's a lot of people who... <laughs> 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 um, anyway, um, a few years after that, or not a few, like a year after that, uh, by then I turned friends with a, with a, with a young man called... DJ Samurai, who is also from Manchester, who um, a little deep in the friendship, he said that, you know, there's a guy named John K that's been checking out you guys' stuff. I'm like, all right, who, who is that? You know, um, he was like, you know, he's a well respected DJ in Manchester. Um, I was like, all right, cool. And he was like, yo, um, well, meet John, you know. So I met John, and then I realized that it's the same. You know, email address. I'm like, <laughs> John. <laughs> hey, John. <laughs> um, and then he started talking about doing an album. You know, I was like, all right, cool, yeah, it's cool. Um, it was, he was like, all right, um, but let's let's let let's limit the vocals a little bit. 
I was like, all right, well, let's do that. You know, we rounded up the troops. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, we, and we did the album that was Bird Sound Power. Um, and you know, while we were doing it, we, we, we didn't really, we, we didn't really think um, much of it. We, we just treated it like, you know, a, 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 you know, just something that we're doing, like, you know, like everything else. It's not like, oh, we're going to do an album and it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And then the album was released. Um, by then, sorry, John had introduced us to um, DDS. Mm -hmm. um, we just had this long email thread going for like literally like one year, maybe like like 300 emails or so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, over that period, you know, we, 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 we found out how deep of a love that the, the, the city of Manchester had for Equinox. And then... Yeah, and then when the album was released, you know, we, we, it was official. All right, Manchester was like second home. <laughs> and then we've just met a whole lot of other people. I think if if Gavin is really to get down into all the people that have become a part of the link, I think we'd need all five of the Red Bull sessions. <laughs> to really discuss this, but there there are also some very um, special people in the room um, right now who have um, impacted us in ways that we didn't know that they were impacting us from before, and we've come to realize, you know, you know how important and how special they are to us. One particularly, I won't say his name, but he knows himself. He's in here. Um, yeah, so it's been the gratification and the support that we've gotten on the road. I have another friend who's in here who I don't know how long it took him to get here from where he's from, probably three hours, four hours. Um, it's been amazing. It's been amazing just to think that we're in Jamaica. I mean, this is the era of globalization and technology. But we are in Jamaica and there are people all across the world who, who are finding joy and happiness and purpose and meaning in, I, I wouldn't even just say music, but in the art form that you have created. And then you get the opportunity to travel to these places where they are and you meet them and the connection is so genuine, so sincere, so real and you realize my music did this, you know. Something I created did this. It's an overwhelming feeling and the gratification is, it just makes, it gives us the drive to continue, you know, and to do more. You know, every, every time we travel, we meet someone, um, whether, it's, whether it's in person through our travels or, you know, through not MSN Messenger, because that no longer exists, <laughs> but through Instagram or Facebook or, or SoundCloud or you know, whatever platform is available, and they reach out to us, and that makes us feel so good. And we feel so good to have all you people here come out to listen to us chat, especially me. Like You must realize right now I love to talk. <laughs> but to listen to to our story and to listen to um, how we've you know come to where we are, we hope that even if it's not just music, but in some aspect of your life, we hope that it will impact you in some way and you know bring some light to something and you know engage you in a way that you know you say you know I, I listened to Equinox talk at the Red Bull lecture. And now I feel like I can go and do that painting or I can go and make that, that outfit or I can go and cook that, that dish or I can go and study that course, you know. We hope that it does for you what you all do for us. Oh, that's a lovely, positive message. Yeah. <laughs>
I think this would be a great time to actually hear something off um, the Bird Sound Power album that came out on DDS Records, which is uh, the record label of Dem Dyke Stair from Manchester. Um, I'm going to be selfish again and play my favourite track, <laughs> which is the opening track called Last of the Mohicans. And I really, I really love it because it, it sounds like an opening track. Like there's this real sense of anticipation and it has all of these like hallmarks of dance hall and then it kind of veers off into sci-fi film soundtrack and I, I find it fascinating so we can talk a little bit about that after we play this and this track is going to be called uh, Last of the Mohicans. Last of the Mohicans by Equinox. <laughs> so I believe that most of the tracks that made it onto Bird Sound Power were kind of rhythms that you'd made over a pretty extended period of time, is that right? Like it was something that was pieced together by you and uh, John Kay and um, Miles from Dem Dyke Stair, so, and Sean. And Sean, okay. Um, so in terms of the next release that came out through Dem Dyke Stair, sorry, through DDS Records, um, Colon Man, is that pronounced correctly, Colon? Because it it's got it a, an accent. Um, <coughs> ha what was the approach to that? Was this also um, a collection or kind of like a retrospective of things that you've been working on or was this newer material? Um, because there was such a small amount of time between those two records that came out through TDS. Yeah, it was it was it was all new stuff. New stuff. It okay. was all new stuff, like over the course of two months. Like two months, yeah. 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 And was there a different approach to um, the production of it, just in the sense of knowing that you're working towards this record that's coming out? And I and I love the transition between Burnt Sound. Bird Sound Power and Colin Man, because Colin Man is even more stripped back and minimal and um, glitchy. Um, so is that something that you kind of, a project that you went into going, okay, we're making this album and this is the palette, or was it still just this kind of organic? A little, a little of everything. I mean, um, some of the trucks influenced by a lot of things. I mean, mainly like even our travels, experiencing new music, and you know new people just even the feelings of different countries being there you know mm -hmm. like in poland we found a kalimba in a friend's house it was his child's toy you know <laughs> <laughs> and you know we sampled that and we we, we really took a lot from what we learned <coughs> and put it back into that and tried to make it like tighter than than bird's own power so it's more it's more like a it's so it's more like an album now, you know, and even the the title of the track. There, there was this other. There was actually a track called Colon Man, mm -hmm. but you know, it it didn't really fit with like the direction of everything. I figured, well, you know, it, we really love that track, but if it if it can't go on it, why don't we just yeah. call the album Colon Man? Then mm -hmm. we have to we have to win in some way. <laughs> <laughs> Not giving up on it. No. <laughs> um, and Colon Man is. Um, as with Bird Sound Power, primarily instrumental rhythms that you've put together. Um, would you like to hear somebody singing or emceeing over these tracks at some point? I mean, apart from, of course, in the live setting when um, you have Shanique and other vocalists, uh, but as they are at the moment, is this is are these tracks that you would hope to feed back into your collective of artists and to see what they do with them as well? Or do you think this is gonna, these two records will stand alone as, as these specific projects? Mm. Not necessarily, you know. Um, not necessarily at all. I mean, if 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 something like that happens, you know, we'd welcome the discussion, you know. Um, but we're, we're definitely not setting out to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to, I'd, I'd love to play a track of um, Colin Man in a in a moment. Um, but just in terms of the multiplicity of sound that you can hear across it as I mentioned before like a lot of glitchy electronic sounds a lot of um, kind of what sounds to me like a UK bass influence do you think or would you say that it's fair to say that this comes at the end of a period of perhaps absorbing other influences as well and kind of cross-pollinating with artists that you've met along your travels mm, definitely yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. is there anything in particular that you can identify as being not one particular influence or a scene or or w was there anything that in particular s sparked the idea for this album? Mm. Mm. 
<laughs> that's, that's, that's quite a good question. I think we have to go home and sleep on that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll email yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send it to me on um, yeah, MSN SoundCloud Messenger. MSN, yeah. But, but like the, even the influences that you're speaking of, I mean, it's just like we'll be at, at shows and like we, 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 it's not like we just go there to perform, we go there to also enjoy. And like hearing like some noise music, you know, hearing some techno, hearing some UK bass. I would say, you know, that, that would have sound a bit tougher with some other things. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we tried to, as Gavin said, you, you know, we may, we may use say, a Timbaland we sample pack, but we turn it into our own. So we, we draw things from other things and just turn it into our own. Very good. Um, I think we should hear a track off uh, Colin Man. And I'm going to select, uh, let's go for Plantain Porridge, because I think this links nicely to what I mentioned before of like taking one particular sound source and really stretching it. And in this particular track, it's a voice, which mm -hmm. is kind of like <laughs> stretched and molded in a multiple, multiple different ways. So um, let's play this one. It's also a very nice porridge. <laughs> <laughs> That was the delicious plantain porridge <laughs> by Equinox. Uh, I'm just going to ask one last question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. Um, what's the key to a good rhythm? You have many keys. You have C, C <laughs> major, <laughs> C minor. give me next card, No. The key to a good rhythm is your heart. That's the key to a good rhythm. Just make the rhythm. <laughs> just, just do it. Just start. Just try not to think about it too much. You know, try not to think, I need to make this rhythm like the rhythm that I just heard on the radio or I just heard in the street. Like, try to make the rhythm based on what you feel, because you hear it, you know. You hear it in your head, and then you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you hear it. Make sure that you use that. What you hear in your head is most likely coming from here. In your belly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is your belly? This is where your belly is here? <laughs> coming from your heart. That's, yeah. But I mean, I'm no big beat maker, so I'm just rhythm, saying. Rhythm, 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 rhythm. <laughs> rhythm. I'm no rhythm maker, so I'll hand it over to the professionals. You got to say about it. Rhythms from <laughs> Shanique Marie coming soon. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it all had the thinking from before. I think in the studio, you should just let it go. Yeah. You do the thinking on your way to the studio, on your way home, on your way to work, on your way to school, wherever. That's where you do the thinking. You know, and in the studio, just be free. Just do it. <laughs> Isn't that Nike? <laughs> um, okay, so at this stage, we're going to open it to questions <laughs> from the rest of you. If anyone has a question or comment, um, just put your hand up and we'll bring a microphone round for you. Hi, so I have um, two questions. The first one, a little bit more opinionated for you guys, but um, how do you feel about artists such as Drake taking the underlying rhythms of like dance hall and rhythm and applying that to a more like top 40 type uh, music. Uh, do you think you should be giving a lot, do you think you should be like taking his time to give a lot of credit and working with dance hall artists or do you think it's perfectly acceptable in an artistic fashion to do that? That good man, you see. <laughs> <laughs> you see with Drake now, Drake is a superstar and from here dance hall you can identify it. You see, dance hall is, is quite limited and also what we can do from Jamaica as well. Like in Jamaica, we can't really use Spotify. We can't make Spotify accounts and things like that. So when Drake uses his own platform and put, puts dance all up there, you know, maybe the chances are, are, are better at it maybe even getting its own category and maybe iTunes are one of them because there's pretty much is no dance all category, just reggae and things like that, yeah. you know. So, I mean, the, the, more, the more strength for us than, you know, when other people use it. Uh, so my second question is, um, since you guys are very like sample oriented in the beat, do you ever have a problem finding uh, still, like, clearing your samples or is it mostly stuff that you have in the catalog of your own recordings? <laughs> um, the, the, like, most, most of the times the sample like just myself, 
like but like clearing we we we, we haven't really run into much problems with clearing um maybe that's because of, like a lot of groundwork from before anything is put out and um the 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 I remember like trying to contact like a few years ago I, I was trying to put out some music and I was trying to contact somebody to clear some samples that was from like this Star Trek episode and, <laughs> and I had to contact Sony and then I contacted Sony and they sent me to Decca and then I contacted Decca and then they sent me back to somewhere else and it, it's just quite complicated so um unless unless you're doing like major production that you know will will get attraction from these people or the copyright owners you know you should seek out clearance so in any case in a legal term you know you you can say that okay i, I sought to clear the sample from you it, it was pretty much impossible to get in contact and what we recommend as well is to be creative and make your own samples and when you make your own samples, you don't have to worry about clearing them because they're yours. And you remember that samples can be made from anything at all. Me speaking right now could be your next sample, but you're not gonna do that. Uh, but yeah, so that's, we're encouraging that as well. You know, tap into your creativity and make your own samples too. You were you were talking a bit about how in ten years it basically went from people contacting you over MSN Messenger to SoundCloud, and I was curious how um, technological advancements over the same period of time, whether it comes to DAWs or sampling, uh, impacted the way you make music in the same way that there was that transition socially. So could you? Could I, I, I missed a, a small part so, of it. So over, you mentioned that over ten years, you went from people contacting you over MSN to people contacting you over SoundCloud. So obviously there was a sea change in how people were communicating about music. But in terms of changes over that same period and how you made music, um, can you talk about what that process was? Um, whether the digital audio workstations that you were using changed. Um, if you're using hardware, how that changed over the years, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think we've just just in, added more and more things, you know, um, and not necessarily changed anything per se. Um, so ten years ago, I had a had a MPC um, FL Studio Pro Tools. Um, fast forward to now. Um, what we use now. Um, we've been messing with a lot of Ableton, um, but we still use Pro Tools, and we still use FL Studio, and we still use the MPC. Um, so we haven't really changed out anything. You know, It's just a matter of bringing in more stuff. Um, there's a point in time when we were just messing with hardware. You know, um, there, was a, there was a colleague of mine who had basically just checked out what Steely and Cleave used to use, which are uh, like legendary dancehall producers. And she just basically checked out the stuff that they used to use and just got them off of eBay. And then she, she left them at her studio for a couple months. And a lot of that stuff, built a lot of the stuff that some birds some power. You know, the, the link is, is one of them that, that, that was like Oberheim, um, the, the DX, um, the, the CSO one, um, yeah, we, yeah, we're just messing with that stuff. Um, that that is maybe the only time when something presented itself and then it it, it went away. But outside of that, everything else has been there, and we just added more and more stuff to it. And I guess we all also always just use what we have <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. And pro to, well, Pro Tools in Jamaica is pretty much a staple, a studio staple. But like uh, we really like Ableton, and you know it's just we just use more things now, <laughs> pretty much. So you said you had an MPC uh, ten years ago. Do you still find yourself using that, especially with Ableton? Because I know it's the compatibility with Ableton is not great, but I do love my MPC. So that's where I'm conflicted right now. Yeah, we use it as a standalone, really. Use it as a is that, is that the software? Is that, yeah, is that two thousand five hundred. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we use it as a standalone. Okay. Um, and then what happens is that 
that sound would 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 come into Pro Tools and then would be modified some more. I may bounce that back to Jordan, he may have it in logic. Um I think it's just depending on what side of the bed we wake up on really. <laughs> Um, that, that determines it, the, um, the approach that we take. So now that you're using Ableton, do you find yourself using uh, less audio samples from drum machines and more MIDI-based clips, or um, do you still find yourself like importing all the stuff from your MPC? I, I tell you what, just like about three weeks ago, I was making, I was, I was, I was making a rhythm, and um, the, the, the side chain was on, and, and it was like, the, the kick was like side chain in, just the background noise in my yard, like the, the neighbor's car was driving out. Uh, basically, I just ran for the recorder right away and just recorded that. And then actually put it back in the music and side chain that. So, and, and that was pretty much the basis of the rhythm with, with, um, with, with the kick and snare. You know, so it, it can come from anything really, you know. Um, what is quite interesting, you said it's not changed so much in these 10 years, but the sounds I heard, they changed quite a lot. Like the last sound was really international. I could not guess that this is a sound from Jamaica. So of course the technology influences your music. But I tell you what, 10 years ago we were making that. We were making that, but it, it just wasn't um, being exposed to the world. Like, you know? like <laughs> some trucks of bird sound power like five years old yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the technology, so the instruments are, or the machinery that we've used um, hasn't really changed. Um, it's, it's, how, it's how the sound is being presented. And as, as they mentioned, a lot of it, we've actually had it a long time. We just kind of dusted it off, modified it a little bit and brought it back. So even though time is changing and things are evolving, we've pretty much been using the same stuff all this time. But don't you feel that you developed in a different way? I mean, I need to listen deeper in your records. I yeah, I mean, I mean, as you grow, um, you experience things. And so per perception and um, mental process changes. Um, so I think that is what has changed and has caused um, slightly different sounds coming out in the music. But it's the same physical products that are being used to create these different sounds so the influence is there as as um as time goes by and we go through the different um um years and we we are exposed to different things nice but the technology the technology is the same that we've been using all this time over the years uh, another, another funny thing with the last track was that we actually bounced it because with, with, with Pro Tools, you know, I, I don't know if you know, um, well, the, the version that we have is quite old and it, it bounces in real time, you know. Um, so we actually bounced, sorry, <laughs> we actually bounced, oh, bounced yeah. the track out of Pro Tools and, and forgot to put a lot of the, um, the, the, the drums in. Um, <laughs> and then when we listened back to it, it was like, uh, kind of all right, still. <laughs> um, you know, so had you heard it with the drums, it, it, it maybe would have sounded a, a, a bit more, I don't know, familiar. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a question, just out of curiosity. Um, you mentioned that um, you, you, over the course of the years, you, you met a lot of people in different countries who are very, you know, diehard fans of your music or um, small communities of people who are really into Jamaican dance hall all over the world. But um, since you started touring, I'm sure I, I've seen you guys perform for the first time at Unsound Festival mm -hmm. two years ago. And for example, that is a type of festival, also CTM, that showcases such a broad styles of music. And I imagine uh, Jamaica is a country that that's already very rich with their own music culture. Whereas, for example, Japan, where I come from, we don't have so much musical styles that really developed uh, in the country. So we look out for music from elsewhere. So I was wondering, you know, if you, by, by touring and visiting different places, if you've discovered 
a style of music or type of artist that you really found fresh or new uh, for y- for you guys? Maybe Kuduro for me, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Kuduro. Yep. I, I really love this album last year called I by Still. Um, who, who we met a, a couple of days ago. Um, yeah. Two days that, ago in Barcelona. That, that was very refreshing. That was very refreshing to hear that album. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say, Gum O is another one that Guam Guam <laughs> is another one that I I I definitely have. I I didn't know about it before. Um, it, was it also at Anton that, or was it the, which festival was it? Where we discovered it, Vienna. where I discovered it in Vienna, and I heard it, and I was like, "Whoa!" And you know, with with in Jamaica, with our African background, everything that has that kind of that kind of foundation definitely stands out to me. So Kuduro and the Guam, those are my two that I definitely have latched onto. Yeah. I was just wondering if you had any like uh, uh, advice for aspiring producers and musicians, like you know, from the younger generations or growing up, because like with net neutrality and stuff like that, now it's like become a lot more kind of competitive and stuff. And like I was just wondering if you have any advice about how to become more of an original artist and stuff. Just be yourself. Nothing can be more original than yourself. <laughs> you know? And as you said before, like the key to a good routine, just do it. I mean, if you just be yourself. I don't know what better can come from that. Um, and I'm um, relating to like earlier things, um, Shanik saying like we compete with each other and things like that. I mean, you just compete with your former self and just become better. Yeah. And be persistent. Um, the aim of the game is to stay in the game. Um, never to give up. <laughs> the aim of the game. Yeah, never to give up. I, I have to say if it, if it wasn't for my team, I definitely wouldn't be here today. Um, it's always good when you have people who believe in you. Um, but most importantly, you have to believe in yourself. And you have to say to yourself, I'm a star. And you might not know it yet, but you're going to know it. Um, this is something that um, I've been telling myself from I was very young. I was like, I'm a star. <laughs> uh, you know. And and then and then I met up with these guys who are like, yeah, girl, you're a star for real. <laughs> so um, just just be consistent, just be persistent, and just be your biggest fan, um, and your biggest critic as well. Be real and honest and true to yourself. Um, be reflective. Reflection in everything is is crucial because that allows you to see your growth, to see where you've created something that might not just, it might just not feel like that's the direction you want to go in. Always be analyzing and critiquing yourself so that you push yourself to be your best self. Yeah. Um, also, uh, me and Gavin were having a discussion Gavin. last night, actually. Me and Gavin. Gavin and, and Gavin I. And, okay, Gavin and I were having a discussion. I'm a trained teacher, you know. And so am I. So <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm a trained English teacher, so let's be I, specific. I'm a trained construction teacher. Right, so, I can so that's. Construct sentences. Uh, but I'm <laughs> helping you to construct them in a correct and appropriate way. So and go ahead. I accept that. I, I'm, a tra- I'm a trained get to the point teacher. <laughs> 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 All right. So, like, um, Gavin and I <laughs> were, having, were having a discussion like last night, and we were speaking about like. That Jamaica pretty much been like a, a wormhole in like Earth <laughs> or the space time continuum or whatever. <laughs> Whereas due to um maybe under exposure to like the rest of the world, like as I said, they pretty much just discovered Kudura a few months ago. Um we, we we have a particular kind of naivety that allows us to do things that other people m- maybe won't be able to do. Like y- you probably live in the UK and you say, Okay, I want to do this but then you think about it and you realize that, all right, you know, but if I do this, this person, it won't be allowed to, you know, be done under these circumstances. Or, you know, but in, in Jamaica, we really, we really don't have such a problem. We just do it and, like, 
like when when I'm in the studio or when when I make a new rhythm and like I go down to the studio or at the studio, and I say. Uh, I say, yo, Gavin, hear this. I bought it through the in your world. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to, you also have to have that confidence as well. Yeah. <laughs> A bit of swagger there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And please help me thanking Jordan, Shanique, and Gavin for making that. <laughs>